Hello and welcome everyone. Share my screen just a second. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You can send it to um, MEI events and the or as well, or you can share it yourself too. I think I should important. be able to share it. Yeah. So. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for our inaugural session of the Inter-Asian Book Series organized by the Arabia Asia Cluster here at the Middle East Institute. Um, before we start off into our session today, I want to just give everyone a little background about what led to us planning on, on this series. Um, I mean, at Arabia Asia Cluster and, we've, and people who are sort of more familiar with what we do, we have been talking about inter-Asian methods for a long time. And during our discussion, we realized that one of the issues is that while you get a lot of people um, criticizing the, the area studies uh, model as it stands, so people saying, look, you know, Middle Eastern studies, it's a colonial geography, it's arbitrary, it doesn't work. But what we get to hear a lot less of is alternate models. So we get to hear a lot of like critiques that, that tear down the existing system, but less, less sort of, you know, uh, versions of, of that kind of build up in alternate versions. So, and this is a problem that exists, you know, within the critical humanities beyond this problem, you know, it's, it's easier to say, you know, that we need to provincialize Europe and then, you know, go on to talk for 200 pages about European, you know, philosophers. Um, so, so we thought we'd give, you know, like Singapore being an, 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 an old place that kind of in many ways um, is um, it, it, it like brings together inter-Asia both in its population, in its history, in its culture, and in many ways. So it's like a, it's like a cosmopolis of, of Asia. Um, so I, I thought this would be a good place to bring together scholars from around this world, enabled by the Zoom technology, where we can get reach out to people, different people, to bring them together on very concrete discussions about how to actually go about doing the hard work of doing inter-Asian research and what that actually entails. Um, so I'm very glad to have to kick off this session with Dr. Arunab Ghosh, uh, who is an associate professor at the History Department at Harvard University. Uh, we will, of course, be talking specifically about his latest book, Making It Count Statistics and Statecraft in the Early People's Republic of China, published by Princeton University uh, earlier, I think last year. Um, so if any of you have not you know, gotten a chance to read it, I hope this session would also encourage you to do so and get to it in more detail, because the book really um, is a wonderful, it takes a deep dive into the political, methodological, and philosophical debates within a specific community of Chinese statisticians in, in post-war early communist China. Dr. Ghosh paints the social world of a vibrant network of experts who, as part of the German Statistics Board, were at once engaged in deep abstract thinking and about uh, plugged in with international debates on statistical methods, but at the same time, managing the political demand and exigencies of the state. Um, and, and, and through that process, through this debate between the abstract debate and the practical, they really try to fundamentally remake both the state and society, or at least attempt to rethink how to manage state and societies. Um, what emerges out of this deep dive is, is that we emerge out of with, with a very fresh insight into uh, a very basic fundamental divide within contemporary social sciences about aggregate data uh, with its, you know, and, and in-depth contextual knowledge. And uh, this, this kind of division runs across the book. And what we get uh, from the book is that far from being, this debate far from being limited to the global north was actually very hot and deeply contested within uh, within within uh, within China, within early modern China and the global South more broadly, uh, where different models were being debated and discussed and implemented, and and with with those different statistical or methodological approach, you really get to see different ideas of what a state can do and how it should function. Um, so, and and what Dr. Gorsh does is that he presents both the roads taken along with those that were not taken or that were taken for a little while and then turned back on. Um, so he, he brings, he's put all of these, these at the same level 
and really opens up for us different possibilities, ask us to uh, think alongside these roads not taken, the, the, the specificity of the roads that we actually took, the specificity of the decisions that we made in governing and managing states through a very specific kind of specific methodological approach to statistics as well. With that, I, I'm going to um, give it, give the floor to Dr. Ghosh. Uh, if, sorry, I'm just gonna lay out the format for people as well. Um, so we're gonna start off with a brief slide presentation by Dr. Ghosh um, that gets sets up or that sets, gets a lay the platform for what the argument at the heart of the book is. And from there we can go into more in-depth discussion about um, about way about about more like about both the philosophical underpinnings of these uh, of 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 these statistical models, as well as kind of the history of China, and perhaps even debates about uh, contemporary uh, on on contemporary politics and how that leads us to think differently about you know with COVID times statistics really have been at the center of this contemporary crisis. Uh, and then in the end, maybe if we have time, we can go into more methodological discussion pertinent to the series about how to go about doing inter-Asian research. So thank you so much, Dr. Ghosh, for joining us today. Uh, great, thank you so much. I mean, you, you have done such a, a fantastic job of, of summarizing the book. I feel we should just dive right into the conversation in some ways, but, uh, but uh, you know, as we discussed, maybe I will, I will share some brief slides. Uh, I, had, I had sort of a, a presentation planned, uh, but then uh, listening to Amin right before we began, talk of, you know, the interest in sort of doing a more sort of interactive um, sort of conversation as opposed to just a presentation. What I'll try and do is I'll, I'll condense it and try and sort of rush through it, give you some images, give you some uh, some sense of the, the sort of the key, uh, sort of some of the key sort of driving arguments, the key driving assumptions uh, that informed the work that the statisticians in the 1950s were doing. Uh, and then and then we can proceed to the conversation. So I'll try and be as brief as possible. Uh, but before I dive in, uh, just a quick word of thanks to, to Amim, to the Middle East Institute, uh, to, to Sharon uh, for inviting me. And I'm delighted to, to be here and to be able to share this work, especially as, as Amim mentioned, given that Singapore is, I think, at the heart in some ways, both intellectually, but also geographically to so much of this kind of um, uh, interaction. Uh, you know, we have a long history of it, but I think what we're discovering more recently is how important the 20th century history of these interactions also is. Uh, so, so I'm delighted. I've, I've been to NUS before, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, but I look forward to to, to visiting again uh, soon. So let me quickly share my uh, my screen and uh, dive in. So can everyone see the full screen? Can you confirm or? Yes. Yes. I yeah. Think. Okay. Great. So as as I mean, uh, very very kindly noted, uh, I published a book last year called Making It Count: Statistics and Statecraft in the early People's Republic of China. And at a very sort of basic empirical level, uh, what, the, what the book uh, and what I was trying to do is really understand how did a new state that emerged that was uh, clearly aligned uh, ideologically along sort of socialist and Marxist principles, uh, which means that it, it, it really uh, approached uh, the economy, approached the so society and culture uh, uh, in a sort of in a planned way. So any kind of change that was going to be implemented would be through planned means. How does that kind of state even get about get go, go about knowing the country quantitatively? Because the assumption really is, if you're going to plan things, you need data to plan, and presumably you need good data to plan well. Uh, so that became a sort of a very simple empirical question. In 1949, the PRC is established, the communists come to power, they want to fundamentally change China through plan means. How can they do it if they don't have the data, or what kind of data do they have? So that was sort of the the, the initial motivating question. And uh, as, as Amim suggested, through that, I, I get into debates about state capacity, about state society relations, about statecraft, uh, about histories of socialism, the different kinds of socialism that sort of manifest themselves, um, histories of planning, uh, and of course, uh, histories of data. And I think in terms of uh, uh, the, the inter-Asia focus of this book series, uh, also on, on sort of Cold War science and the ways in which we should understand Cold War science. And I'll try and uh, end with some remarks on that. Uh, so uh, I had a I had a potted uh, version of a talk. I'm not going to do that. As I said, I'll just run through some slides. And uh, I thought it'd be nice, given again the interracial context, to drop us in uh, I guess what's known as in media's res, right, in the middle of the story. And in the middle of the story really is uh, December of 1956, when uh, the Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai is on a visit to India. You know, it's a, it's a month-long visit, and he's traveling all over. 
but in Calcutta, when uh, in December on December 9th, he visits the Indian Statistical Institute and ends up spending a lot more time than was originally allocated for that visit. Uh, and here in this photograph, you can see him uh, uh, being given a tour, and the, the, the gentleman with his uh, finger point, pointing at the machine is is the Indian statistician P.C. Mahalanobis, who uh, established the Indian Statistical Institute in the 1930s in Calcutta. And by the 1950s, the ISI was one of the uh, globally one of the leading centers for both statistical innovation, theoretical innovation, uh, but also application, applying statistics to a whole range of, uh, sort of social science research, and in particular in contributing to uh, planning in India. So John Lai visits, he's deeply impressed by what he sees. Uh, he ends up spending a lot more time there. And as he's leaving, he has a fascinating conversation with Malanobis where he says, um, I'm really excited about what you're doing. And uh, we in China would like to learn more about what you're doing. And in particular, what he's interested in is uh, large scale random sampling, which is a particular kind of technology that's very new in the 1950s. New in particular, not as a theoretical sort of possibility, but new in terms of a practical sort of field tested method of gaining uh, social data. So gaining data about large scale social phenomena in a, in, a time, uh, in a timely manner, in an accurate manner, and in a very cost effective manner. And the ISI is at the forefront globally at this time of this kind of technology. So the reason I want to start with this, uh, uh, this image and this, uh, this visit is really to, to suggest to you actually that this is an aberration in terms of how we understand 1950s Chinese history. The fact that Zhou Enlai is so interested in essentially what are cutting edge scientific methods in India. And uh, give you a quick sort of background up to about 1956, the Chinese had actually been consciously rejecting any kind of over overture from India or from other countries that were not uh, clearly in sort of what you can think of as a socialist bloc or in particular close to the Soviet Union. Uh, in, in, 19, in the early 50s itself or right after 1949, the Chinese had decided to follow the Soviet model of industrialization quite closely. And that in some ways precluded these kinds of, uh, uh, of you know, other kinds of exchanges, other kinds of of interactions. Um, and, but I want to stress that it's not purely sort of an ideological commitment, it's not purely a political commitment. Uh, th there were hints to why this didn't make sense even as early as 1951 when the Chinese sort of very reluctantly attended uh, the 27th session of the International Statistical Institute uh, in New Delhi uh, in 1951. And the economist Di Chaobai, who was sort of delegated or deputed to attend, he was already part of a cultural delegation in India at that time. And he said that he was told basically go and spend a day or two there. And he, he, he left a, a written statement and, and this is an excerpt from the statement where he said, we are of the opinion that the theories, methods and systems in connection with statistics adopted in a country cannot but be closely linked with the social system of the country in question. So this provides a little bit of a clue as to what's going on. It's not simply, oh, we are in, a, in, in sort of the socialist camp and therefore we are not going to align with you know, the, the India who, whose politics or, or its, whose position in the world is, is unclear whether it's, it's still part of the imperial, former imperial world and so on. Uh, but there is a, a, a deep seated debate going on about what is the nature and definition of statistics itself. Now, what happens over the course of the 50s is, and I'll, I'll pro pro provide a very brief sense of, sense of this in a moment, uh, is that, uh, that, that uh, uh, I, I give a sense of that what, what, that, what those principles are and how those principles are challenged. Uh, but what else happens is in, in the process of them being challenged is by 1956, there is an exposure to what's going on in India. And I think an important moment in that is this uh, Indian Planning Commission delegation that visits in 56, and for the first time gives Chinese statisticians a sense of what is going on in India. Uh, so this becomes an opening and, and John Lai's visit uh, follows later that, that year and very quickly. So I just, I'll just sort of uh, spell this out. You have a series of exchanges that follow. So close on the heels of John Lai's visit, you have uh, a Chinese delegation that spends over a month in uh, Calcutta at the Indian Statistical Institute. And here are some, you know, the, the gentleman reading is, is Wang Sofa. I'll show a photograph of him momentarily. He's the deputy head of the, one of the deputy heads of the State Statistics Bureau at that time. Uh, and he's accompanied by uh, three other members. They're ostensibly there to attend the 25th celebration, the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Indian Statistical Institute, but they end up staying for a month and they're really focused on studying large scale random sampling. They go back, they try and uh, promote uh, in a major way the adoption of large scale random sampling in China, uh, in particular in the agricultural sector, something that had been, uh, as, I, as I briefly alluded to, a, a real anathema up to that point. Uh, this is followed shortly after Wang Sehua's return. Uh, he also begins to engineer along with his boss, 
Shuemo Chiao, and you can see the two of them on the extreme right here, uh, Wang Sefo on the extreme right and Shuemo Chiao next to him, they begin to engineer uh, plans to, to try and bring PC Mahalanobis over to, Cal over to Beijing uh, for an, an extended range of discussions about large-scale sampling. I won't go into the details, but Mahalanobis spends about three weeks uh, over the summer of 1957 in, in, uh, in China. He meets with a range of people, delivers a whole range of lectures, all kinds of discussions. Uh, and this is a, an image of, I think, right before his departure when, when Joe and Lai hosts him uh, for dinner. So again, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going rather rapidly through these. Uh, so, so far I've talked about these three fairly important sort of dramatis personae. You have Wang Sefua, who uh, leads the delegation in 56, who is a major proponent of uh, uh, the adoption of large-scale random sampling. His boss, Shui Chiao, also is very open to this idea by 56, 57, and the person their they're main interlocutor is, is PC Malanobis. And again, in discussion, if, if there's interest, I'm happy to, you know, talk more about them and their, their sort of trajectories in some ways. Uh, the final important round in these exchanges that happens is uh, over the course of the 1958 calendar year, where two young statisticians from China spend the entire year at the ISI uh, studying large-scale random sampling techniques. And uh, the idea really is that they will, they will learn these things and then come back and train a, a whole new generation of statisticians at the State Statistics Bureau in China. And again, the focus is, as I said, on, on, on large-scale uh, random sampling. So that's sort of, uh, the, 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 in, in very brief, almost schematic terms, the exchanges that I map out that are fundamentally iteration, and maybe at the end or in discussion, I can talk about what makes them especially interesting, I think. Um, but for me, discovering the story was really useful because it allowed me to actually appreciate uh, what was going on within China and what, how, how in some ways, uh, how much of an aberration, how cataclysmic this kind of exchange might have appeared to a lot of stat statisticians at that time, because they went so much against the received wisdom at that point, or so much against, received wisdom is probably the wrong word, so much against the very conscious choices that had been made about how to define statistics and how to, how to, how to institute statistical work. So there is, uh, to go back to the early 50s and give you a sense of what this was and, and, and what is going on with an understanding of statistics. This is Li Fu Chun, who was the deputy head of the Central Finance and Economics Committee in 1951, who provides a, a sort of a riff on the, the Di Chabai quote I shared with you a short while earlier, where he says, in the past, China was a semi-colonial, semi-feudal country. Strictly speaking, it did not possess any statistics worth speaking of. Statistics in old China was learned from the Anglo-American bourgeoisie. This kind of statistics cannot serve as a, a weapon. It is unsuitable for the task of managing and supervising the, the country. We need to build a new statistics for a new China. So, you know, you see both the, the kind of larger politics as it's, as, as it's playing out, as the Cold War is taking shape, but also actually uh, enough here to say that what we're doing is actually fundamentally different as an enterprise. Uh, and so what did he mean? In order to understand what he meant and in order to understand what the stakes were, uh, I want to sort of sketch out what, you know, I try and sort of, explain as sort of the three broad approaches to ascertaining social fact in the 1950s. And arguably, these are the three broad approach, uh, approaches to argue, uh, assessing or ascertaining social fact and even in the present or at any point in time, right? So you have one mode is the ethnographic mode, which again, several social sciences, sociology, anthropology, historians, they use extensively, right? But this really relies on the, uh, the, the authority that is gained by the individual researcher being present within the phenomena that they are studying, right? So your personal experience of the things that you're talking about is absolutely crucial to an ethnographic mode of ascertaining social fact. Again, in the interest of time, I won't belabor this, uh, but we can talk more about it in discussion. Uh, so you have the ethnographic mode, then you have another mode of, 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 of ascertaining social fact, which I, which I label exhaustive, which really is about going out and counting everything that you need, whatever you, know, you want to count, but counting every instance of that. So this, in, in, in simple terms, is, is exhaustive enumeration, right, uh, of the census method. Uh, and, and this becomes, the reason I have it highlighted is because this becomes the, uh, both the de jure and the de facto means adopted in the early 1950s. And I'll give you, a, a, in a moment, I'll explain why. The third is, is stochastic or, or randomized approaches, right, which don't, which say that neither the ethnographic nor the exhaustive method is really ideal, but what we need to do is apply some kind of randomized approach that allows us to get, and the claim is that through a randomized approach, uh, we will get actually a much, much more accurate sense of social reality. So where, where, where is this distinction and where is this, uh, this emphasis on the exhaustive mode, the desire to count everything, uh, every unit of whatever that we need to count coming from? Uh, in very simple terms, uh, it comes from uh, a real definitional debate 
about the nature of social reality and what statistics is supposed to study. So what, what Chinese statisticians are doing, and they're in dialogue with Soviet statisticians at this point, because this is also very much the dominant mode of approaching statistics in the Soviet Union, is that they say that, well, statistics is not a universal science, it's not a natural science, it's a social science. It's a social science meant to study social relations, so individuals and their activities. And in, in so doing, what they're saying is therefore, the, the, kind, the laws that operate in the natural world or the laws that are universal are not the laws that oper operate in the social world. And in particular, the law that they're most concerned about, or not the law, but the, the principle that they're most concerned about has to do with questions of chance and uncertainty. So here, what they're doing is essentially going back to a fairly, one could argue, reductive reading of Marx in certain places, where Marx himself says that the natural and the social world are distinct, and you cannot study them the same way. There are different sets of laws for the social world, different sets of laws for the natural world. And of course, if you, again, continue in this, in this mode, then uh, you can follow Marx's teleological progression to say that, well, we know how history is going to unfold, or we know how the future is going to unfold, rather. We are all progressing through different stages to eventually socialism, socialism and then eventually communism. So they take this and push it further to say, therefore, uncertainty, randomness, and chance have really no place in the social world. Uh, what you have in the social world are various kinds of laws, the laws of production, uh, you know, you have class analysis and things like that, but you don't have uncertainty. If you don't have uncertainty, then you can't really use those kinds of methods that are based on uncertainty or chance or randomness or probability uh, to devise methods for ascertaining social fact. Uh, so, you know, once you accept the initial premises, it's a very, logically, it's a very consistent set of, uh, uh, set of arguments. But what it does is it breaks down, and this is a sort of a, a simple table where I try and sort of summarize uh, these distinctions. What it does is it creates a, div a, a divide between statistics as is, as is understood by most other parts of the world, where they don't make this strong divide between uh, a, a social science and a natural science. Uh, and then what, what you do see in, uh, in, in China and the Soviet Union. So very quickly, what this means is there's no chance in the social world when you look at socialist statistics, only laws that can be ascertained. And the really the best way to proceed is to count everything exhaustively. The best count is the complete count, right? So what this means is a reliance on methods of exhaustive enumeration, uh, periodic reports, uh, typical sampling, and so on. Again, if there's interest, I can come back to this table during discussion. Uh, very quickly then, what this means uh, on a more concrete level methodologically is that you, you end up with a, a system that privileges exhaustive enumeration. Uh, it's known as the complete enumeration periodical, statistical periodical report system. Um, uh, that's the translation from the Chinese. Uh, and then on occasion, you are also using one-time censuses or you're using essentially non-randomized non survey sampling. So the ethnographic mode of some sort or the other. You know, <clears throat> and there are various different ways to think about it typical sampling, quota sampling, purpose of sampling, and so on. Um, again, very quickly, what this means is by the 1950s, you have to essentially construct, if you're counting everything exhaustively, you have to construct a massive system uh, that is basically a, a, a vast nested tree with Beijing at the top, the state statistics bureau at the top, and then provincial bureaus, county level offices, and, and um, offices at the village or cooperative level. And I've given you a sense of what the scale of the numbers is and the claim by 1956 that there are 200,000 full-time statistical cadre working. And of course, you have many more who are part-time part -time employees. <clears throat> there are two other things I want to remind people of that are crucial to understanding uh, both economic activity, planning, and the ways in which statistical uh, activity was taking place. Uh, which is that there was during this period a tremendous emphasis on material production over service-based activities. Uh, this again had to do with the nature of the socialist economy and how they were measuring. So this is something that doesn't change until actually, for those of you who are familiar with this history, would know probably until the late 80s and early 90s when both the Soviet Union and the PRC switch over from the material product system of accounting for economic production to the uh, system of national accounts, which is what the UN had been using, which tries to balance uh, both material production along with service, the service industry. Uh, so, but, but this has implications for how data is collected. If you're only privileging material physical objects that are being produced, then that generates certain kinds of incentives. The other uh, important sort of trend that colors uh, the way in which statistical work takes place is an overwhelming emphasis on, on industrial production uh, at the expense of uh, agricultural production. And this is sort of a very conscious desire to industrialize in a specific way by focusing on heavy industries. And in order to do so, agriculture is really seen as 
primarily a source of surplus, surplus that can be invested into heavy industry to promote heavy industrialization. What this means, of course, is that industrial data is emphasized, agricultural data, which they need, tends to suffer. It also suffers because the agricultural sector is so much larger, so much more dispersed, um, geographically, climatically, uh, in so many other ways. So there's a real lopsided nature to the way in which data, the, the quality of data emerges. Um, and I'll, I'll skip this and maybe we can come back to the, uh, this in discussion. I'll, I briefly want to suggest some of the problems that emerge. So you have you know, the, the kinds of uh, the, the emphasis on industry, the emphasis on material products leads to a whole range of problems uh, by, by the 1950s, 56, 57, precisely the time when the exchanges uh, with, uh, with India begin. Uh, and some of these, you know, you can summarize as a, a tremendous amount of over, overproduction of data, partly because you're incentivizing the production of tables themselves. Uh, there is a tremendous problem with incommensurability. So, you know, you have, uh, if you don't have standardized units, if you don't have standardized, other kinds of standardization and different levels of the system are producing different kinds of data, then very quickly, there's no sense, uh, it's very difficult to make sense of, of, of what has actually been produced. And overproduction and incommensurability sort of combine in some ways to then, of course, generate tremendous delays. So there's uh, the the reports that I've read, as, you know, constantly complain about these issues. Uh, and there's a there's a wonderful phrase that basically suggests that most of these reports are useless at the moment of creation. There's sort of a complete frustration, you know. So you can produce them or you cannot produce them. It makes no difference to us because in the end, what what is in them is absolutely worthless. Uh, and in some ways, the one way in which I try and articulate what is happening here is is the emergence of a particular kind of uncertainty principle to, 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 to you know, sort of borrow from, from Werner Heisenberg himself, you know, this is data's uncertainty principle, which really is this tension between accuracy and timeliness that emerges very clearly. If you need accurate data, then often it's gonna be late. If you provide data in a timely fashion, then you're always worried about its accuracy, right? And this tension is something, again, that as, as Amin was suggesting about contemporary issues is very much around with us today. How do we balance, uh, balance these two, uh, two things? Uh, what's interesting is that in 1957, Shermu Chiao, the director of the SSB actually comes out and, and adjudicates on this tension. And he says, in order for the leading authorities to understand the situation, research questions and decide on policies, they frequently need reference data on a timelier basis. Such data need not possess a high degree of accuracy or be comprehensive, but it must be supplied in a timely fashion. So this is an interesting moment where it suggests that this tension is being so viscerally felt, but the response is really to say, give us the data, no matter how imprecise it is. What it does, of course, is it opens the, uh, it, uh, you know, the, 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 the dams are, are um, uh, the gates are open now for all kinds of estimation to be further provided, which leads to uh, a whole round of essentially data becoming more and more removed from certain kinds of ground realities that they're trying, uh, that they're trying to, to mimic. So this is the situation in 1957, which is precisely when these exchanges with India really become uh, an important way to perhaps try and solve this problem, this, this over-reliance on exhaustive enumeration and this particular mode of thinking about uh, the distinction between the natural world and the social world. Again, in discussion, I'm happy to talk about what the how the Indian statisticians understood this distinction and and and, and sort of uh, how people like Wang Sapa, Shomucha were responding to it. Um, but I'll kind I want to sort of conclude very quickly uh, with with a, a quick coda on what happens afterwards. So I you know to return to this slide where I talked about these three modes. Uh, in some ways, by 1958, you have had both. Uh, 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 sort of a major investment in the exhaustive mode, a dalliance with the stochastic mode. But what happens in 1958 is that you see both of these modes get rejected in favor of a, a fundamentally ethnographic mode of doing social, of collecting statistical data. And a lot of this has to do with uh, the uh, sort of changing political currents surrounding the Great Leap Forward, which is really this utopian kind of, it's, it's, it, it's in lieu of the second five-year plan in China, and it's a sort of a very utopian approach to economic planning, economic organization, as well as social organization uh, that, uh, that, that fundamentally rejects. So the aim is to, to sort of surpass uh, the UK steel production uh, in 15 years and, and, and so on. Uh, but what it does is it completely breaks this, uh, you know, that system that I spoke of from Beijing down this pyramidical uh, system of, uh, of reporting uh, of periodical reports and replaces it essentially with uh, an ethnographic mode where as the economy itself becomes atomized into communes, uh, the commune then becomes the sole uh, uh, source of statistical data and the data that is collected has to be collected through ethnographic means. Again, in Q&A or in discussion, I can, I can describe what the shift is, but again, it's a theoretical move that's being made. It's not simply a rejection of 
the exhaustive mode because the politics had changed. Now there's a theoretical argument being made that the only way you can ascertain truth, social truth, is by being on the ground, by experiencing things personally. And for inspiration, they're going back to uh, some of Mao's writings from the late 1920s, in particular his 1927 report uh, of an investigation into the peasant movement in Hunan, which becomes sort of a founding text for this, um, this new mode or new method of ascertaining social fact. Uh, I won't go into the details, but of course it has implications for uh, how data is collected and implications for the famine that follows from 1959 to 62, which, um, you know, by conservative estimates, um, caused at, at least 30 million, 30 million deaths. So just very quickly, and, and I'll just I'll just mention these because maybe we'll, we'll cover them in conversation. Um, but uh, some of the ways in which I think uh, some of the things that I'm in dialogue with that I'm hoping to sort of uh, uh, engage people with or or, or, uh, or themes that are that are uh, embedded in the book, of course, is the thinking about planning and the place data and facts play in planning, uh, and then specifically in understanding the nature of planning in China in the 1950s. And one of the things that emerges is this the sense that there were copious facts that were generated, but the state remained poorly informed in many ways, right? So there's this interesting disjuncture that emerges. Uh, the other important thing, uh, and this uh, relates, I think, to contemporary discussions also, especially with regard to China, but more broadly in this uh, age of COVID, is, is manipulation of data and how that happens. Uh, and and you know the suppression of data that's not uh, that the state or any other institution is not comfortable sharing and and how those how those how that um, suppression or manipulation is achieved. Uh, what I find in the in 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 the book and in doing the research is uh, another sort of another sort of source for the ways in which data can be biased that is not really about this kind of late stage manipulation, but has to do with essentially um, starting assumptions or your found you know founding principles, and those also generate interesting path dependencies as. Uh, as the reliance on on uh, on exhaustive enumeration did in the 1950s. So I think disentangling or disaggregating the ways in which data is produced is extremely important in understanding then uh, both how useful data can be, but also how problematic data can be. So again, I think a lesson that's very valuable to, for today. Uh, very briefly, also the the few other the other points. Uh, one of the things that I'm really trying to do uh, is 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 disaggregate the history of quantification of statistics. As it has been understood for uh, for a lot, you know, what is sort of the the dominant understanding, which really is the rise of a kind of probabilistic way of thinking about uh, about our world. Uh, this is a this is a sort of a revolution that takes place starting in the early modern world, but really becomes a feature of everyday life by the late 19th century and especially into the 20th century. And what I find is that as late as the 1950s, although you have a shared sense that data is tremendously valuable and transformative for any kind of uh, state making, any kind of uh, social engineering, uh, what the methods appropriate for that kind of, uh, for those goals are, can actually diverge spectacularly. So it's not just that the probabilistic revolution in some ways is dominant, you see actually major divergences, a major contestation in the post-49 world, uh, post-45 world as well. So I think that there are interesting things to think about in terms of both the convergences, convergences regarding data enthusiasm, but then the divergences in terms of methods, in terms of assumptions. Um, and then uh, finally, you know, um, um, thinking about interracial, what well, I began with, uh, the, the example of, of statistics and the China-India exchanges, I think, is, is a really interesting instance of what my, my, one might call interation, what I call South-South uh, technological exchange, that's happening at what, that is, that is engaging with the kind of technology that is cutting edge at that time. In the 1950s, large-scale random sampling is a new, exciting technology all over the world. And the Indian Statistical Institute, as one of the major centers for this kind of research, is drawing people from uh, the US, Western Europe, but also the Soviet Union and the Socialist Bloc, and then by 1956 and 57, China as well, uh, to try and understand what these methods are. So it's, it's a kind of uh, a, a scientific exchange that is not derivative, it's not second order, which is you know typically how we have understood a lot of the history of Cold War science, where you have the Soviet Union, the US as these nodes, and I'm, I'm speaking of them as representative, right? The socialist bloc and, and, and the Anglophone, perhaps the Western Europe and America as these nodes from which all scientific and te technological knowledge uh, emanates or disseminates. And then these other countries are adopters and, 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 and so on. So this is an interesting sort of counterpoint to that model. And my, my suspicion is that the more we search, more instances we'll find of other interesting things that are going on uh, that will paint a very different picture of how we think about post-World War II uh, to scientific networks. Uh, so I think there's a lot of interesting research going on in this area. Some of, some of my ongoing work is also in this area, and I'm happy to talk about some of the new work that I've done 
in this connection. I'll stop there because I know you want to talk about, I mean, you want to talk about contemporary relevance anyway. So I'll stop there and we can maybe leave that for discussion. Sorry, I was hoping to take about 20 minutes. I've taken 30, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for listening. No, thank you so much. I think that was perfect. It laid out the grounds uh, really for the discussion. Um, as we go forward, I mean, like everyone, anyone who feels, you know, feel free to ask a question either by typing it in and sending it to me and I can read it out or, you know, we'd prefer that if you could unmute yourself since we want it to be a more sort of personal and, and, and um, sort of, you know, like informal session. So just unmute yourself and ask the questions as well. Um, and, uh, but um, uh, before, I think Alex has a question. We can we can go into before we go into uh, like we can we can maybe start with Alex, and then we can go into later session. Alex, um, Alex is is a colleague here at MEI who also works on um, China and who sort of I think mostly he works on digital technology and uh, and 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 uh, private security, um, mm -hmm. but he can tell you more. Alex, uh, can you unmute yourself and if you want to ask. Yes, thank you very much, Amim, and uh, Dr. Ghosh, thank you very much uh, for your very interesting presentation. I'm looking forward to have a deep reading of your book. Uh, my question, uh, maybe is try to link uh, uh, what you have just expressed about past of China in terms of statistics with the present use of data. Uh, the, the shift uh, from stochastic to ethnographic was quite important, but in my personal opinion, the most important part is the politicization of data uh, at the time, uh, politicization that led uh, to a kind uh, of lisenkism uh, as it happened in the Soviet Union. Uh, nowadays, in contemporary China, st economic statistical data, uh, uh, it's, um, it's part of national security. You cannot release data in advance. Uh, some kind of statistic analysis uh, uh, has been let down. For example, uh, Gini coefficient uh, that was quite used 15 years ago. But if I recall correct, uh, again, 10, 15 years ago, there was an article on uh, China Daily who say that two plus two in China statistic doesn't always mean it's four. Uh, and it was referred to the GDP calculation because there, if you calculate the GDP of China, there is always a hidden province. You put all the province GDP together and it doesn't add. Uh, in an era uh, of AI where data is extremely important, uh, what's your opinion uh, on the role of politicization of data on contemporary China? Great, thank, thank you. This is a great question. And I think uh, part of what I uh, uh, show in the book is is that so I, I would I would do uh, do a slight pushback to to say that you know it's not just the 50s or or today in China that data is politicized. I think we have to recognize that data is all data is politicized. So the question really becomes including in in more sort of liberal societies in in, in other contexts. So the the question really becomes what is politicization doing to the data? What is the nature of politicization and what kinds of incentives? What kinds of biases are then being generated? And at what stage of uh, the process of data production are those biases being generated. And I think the examples you have cited, which are really important ones, the Gini coefficient, uh, and of course GDP, which is really the elephant in the room when we think about you know, the index that everyone knows about, but everyone has very little understanding of how, it, how it's produced in the end, uh, is, is a good example of these. But these are all the kinds of manipulation that really happen in some ways. Uh, you, know, you take the data from, uh, in some ways, from the county, uh, the prefecture to the province, and eventually the national level. And then, when the, the provincial level data is aggregated, then you, then, you know, then the, the statisticians at the National uh, Statistics, uh, National Bureau of Statistics, as it is known now, they they sort of have to massage the data as may as as need need be. So, so I think that 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 is hugely important. It's happening all the time. I think it happens in other con in in the COVID context. Most other countries have done this kind of what you can think of as. Uh, what is it, ex post anti post hoc manipulation in some ways, I think uh, is, is, is a feature. Um, uh, but, uh, but the important thing then is to, to, to say, well, uh, is that the only way in which data is being biased? Uh, on GDP, I'm sorry, I should, one, one other quick thing I should mention is that I haven't looked at this very closely beyond relying upon the work of Carsten Holtz, who's at, uh, I think, at, the at Hong Kong University, who has done a lot of very interesting uh, work on the quality of GDP data in China. And he comes out, and so I don't know if you've read him, and if you ever, I would love to hear your opinion on his work. Uh, but my sense from reading him is that he he doesn't think that the data is as heavily compromised as we often think of it 
uh, as being, that there is a certain kind of internal consistency to it, which doesn't mean that there isn't manipulation going on and there isn't a certain kind of projection made, especially in terms of you know, how important it becomes to project a certain kind of status in the world as whether it's the fastest growing large economy and so on. So, but, but, so, so part of what I'm trying to do is disaggregate that kind of uh, manipulation from these earlier sets of assumptions that are also actually political, but there are also at times theoretical distinctions that are being made. And, and in understanding this, so uh, to answer at a broader level, how do we proceed? I think the way we proceed is through having a better sense of precisely how data is being produced. And um, I find it useful to think about it also in terms of there was a fourfold distinction used by uh, Chinese statisticians in the 1950s itself, which I think is a useful way to schematically break it down. So, you know, you have collection, you have then collation. So collection is the actual just, you know, gathering the data. Again, you have to be very careful about how is the data being gathered. And a lot of the book really devotes itself to precisely the, uh, the kind of guiding principles that inform data collection. But that's one stage. Then how is the data being collated? How is it being summarized and put together? Uh, then you get to the third stage, which is research. What kinds of research are being performed on that data? By whom? And then the final stage is how is the data being supplied? And here again, your point about data being a, a national security issue. This actually is not a new thing. It was uh, data was a national security issue in the 1950s also. So very little data was actually publicly made available to um, forget uh, foreign researchers or foreign scholars, even to the average Chinese person in the 1950s. It was a very sort of controlled way in which data was released. Um, so, so that's one schematic way in which we can think about and sort of interrogate each of these stages, the collection, collation, research and supply with that kind of critical eye to how is this being actually done? What are the assumptions undergirding each stage? And then what are the implications in terms of biases? Biases that are uh, internal versus biases that are overtly political. So it's, I think it's, it's a fine distinction, but it's a really important distinction because it allows us to avoid making sort of blanket statements or oh, that this is all political because I think all data is political, you know, even in the US or where I'm based or in other contexts that I'm just somewhat familiar in India, uh, you know, if you look at statistical institutions, the way in which data is used, there's a tremendous amount of politics that goes into it. I, I'll give you one sort of anecdote, I guess, as, as, as an example of this. In, in the early, early 2000s, I was in, uh, I, I used to work at the Urban Institute in, in Washington, DC, which is a, a very large sort of social and economic policy think tank known for empirical research, sort of data-based sort of uh, number crunching kind of research. And occasionally I would go from the Urban Institute uh, to Capitol Hill to attend uh, these hearings about different policy issues. I was doing a lot of work on health policy research at the time, so US health policy. And typically when you had these hearings, these are not these big, big name hearings. These were often sort of smaller hearings for specialists. So in the bowels where you had a smaller audience and you typically had someone who represented a more liberal think tank and then someone who represented a much more right-wing conservative think tank. And they were discussing you know, something like maybe health insurance coverage and, you know, what, are, what is going on in a particular state. Same data they're, they're drawing upon to mount ex very different kinds of arguments, right? Uh, and, and that starts from the, the fact that they're collecting the data, they're assessing the, the nature of the data that's been collected also very differently. And so that kind of sort of, uh, that was my first sort of, it's one thing to read about it and think about it in the abstract. That was my first sort of instance as a young person to encounter this kind of, the ways in which uh, the, the claimed objectivity of data and the obvious sort of ideology and politics can be so clearly seen to be intertwined. And the task I think for us really then becomes to try and unpack this. And, and part of what I'm doing in the 50s, I think is it's trying to unpack that, that the politics um, and, the, uh, and the science as it were and, 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 and how they sort of mutually influence each other. And I think the task for us today is very similar, uh, is that how do we go beyond uh, the statements? How do we go beyond sort of more sort of uh, a dismissal of, of, of all kinds of data production to try and understand what, what is really informing some of these decisions. Because a lot of this may not then end up be, it may not always be, you know, uh, high level political interference. There could be other things that are actually affecting data in, in, in sort of uh, fairly fundamental ways. Uh, thank you. Can I thank like, you me push you? Yeah, please. Can I push you, push you a little bit? I mean, like the, uh, the idea of like secrecy of data that Alex brings yeah. up. Um, how does that come about? What's the historical roots of how does uh, data become such a cherished like state secret? Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So my sense is this is they're drawing, so the Soviet Union does this too at this time in the in the 40s and 1950s. Um, some of this I think gets colored by, um, by the Cold War and the tensions of the Cold War where the 
sort of sharing or divulging of data is seen to threaten national security in some ways. They will know our industrial capacity. They will know, you know, how much grain we have stocked up. So the, I think that is partly what's driving it. Uh, but it doesn't, that doesn't, you know, I, I, should, I, should, I should not say more because I don't, I don't have, I haven't looked at it more, more closely than that. But I think that is partly the logic driving it. But of course, what that means is that you, your own people are also relatively uninformed. Uh, about what's going on. So what you do see in terms of data that is being circulated is that you see you have annual bulletins uh, that were highly curated. So to go back to Alex's question, right? So highly curated data that is shared at the end of the year uh, to say, you know, this is what production was like. This is what, you know, uh, public health, the expansion of hospitals, or, or, you know, various kinds of data, but it's highly curated. And that becomes the only snapshot that both uh, the average Chinese person has in the 1950s, but also than any observer has. So I think it's an attempt to heavily control the narrative. And there again, perhaps the, the echoes are are, are present, with, are, 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 are there with, with, the, with the present, uh, but it's something that is remarked upon by a lot of people visiting China. Um, and, uh, and they're like, why should this be, you know, why is this a state secret? I mean, this is, this is data that should be in circulation so people can use it, people can do research. Uh, and, uh, but it is, it is, it is, a feature of the nature of the state at that time. And it's something that I've seen in archive, archival materials being deliberated upon and consciously being reaffirmed. So uh, to take the example of PC Malanobis, he's very interested in all kinds of data at the disaggregated level to understand, say how Chinese industrial policy actually plays out from 53 to 57 during the first five year plan. And they deliberate. They say, should we do this? Should we give him data? And then they say, no, only share what is already in the public domain, right? So, so there is there is a, a a kind of sort of real concern that if this goes out, then then uh, the, uh, uh, national security will be threatened. Uh, let me, uh, a final point of that: I think it's not a completely irrational fear if you think about how the CCP has come to power. I mean, the fact that you know we think of that now, looking back, it's it's a fait accompli. Of course, they were going to win the civil war, but you know it was through a, a range of fairly contingent events that they became the dominant political force by 1948 in China. And I think there must have been an internal recognition of that, that, that this is a really hard won victory and it cannot be jeopardized so easily. So that perhaps is also feeding into some of this thinking. Thank you. If I could maybe like um, step back a little bit and ask a more abstract question. Um, so I was very interested, we often get to hear in grad school and so on about, you know, Marxist uh, social theory, Marxist literature theory, or sort of you know, Marxist economics. Um, but socialist statistics, I mean, at least for me, this is the first time I really encountered it in detail and in depth. And it from, from what it seems like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this was not just, um, you know, let's say statistics as we know it with, you know, a different lipstick or different, you know, like red glasses on. But it was it was actually uh, it, it it fundamentally like uh, taught the basis of statistics to be uh, in in different ways, um, or as you say, you know, it taught about social reality in different ways. Um, I mean, you mentioned it briefly in your opening remarks about how it led to different understanding of randomness in human nature. But could you elaborate more, like about what what really was at the heart of this debate between um, socialists and emergent? socialist statistics and, and sort of a, a, a more sort of established liberal statistic method as well. Sure, so um, yeah, so this is really at the crux of, of uh, a lot of the, both the debates and then the actions that the Chinese statisticians took in the 1950s. Uh, so, so a little bit of, uh, I guess, background might be, might be useful, which I sort of, uh, I think didn't, didn't um, offer in my opening remarks. <clears throat> so um, as I alluded, you know, there is this sort of sense that the um, 19th and 20th centuries is really, or even from the early modern period onwards, uh, the, the broader story is one of, uh, of human beings becoming comfortable with the ideas of randomness and chance as being a regular feature of the world, right? And once you, once you make that switch from, in, in, before that, essentially, chance events were seen to be the act of divine will or, you know, something like that. That's how human beings made sense of of uh, um, an earthquake or something like that. Uh, but, but starting in the, the, I guess, 18th century onwards, you sort of start seeing different approaches to these ideas of chance and randomness, which sort of then get understood as being a regular feature of the world and not aberrations. And what emerges then is as essentially, if you think about the broader history of statistics, two sort of, there are two parallel tracks on which 
people who are interested in thinking about numbers in this way are operating. One is the state, and the state has a very long history of trying to track how many people, uh, you know, by state, of course, I mean rulers, kings, how many people, how many subjects they have, how much land they have, but primarily for taxation, for war making, and so on. So that, that interest goes back, you know, pretty much all the way to state formation itself. Uh, the other is sort of these, essentially, the other community is, is um, broadly speaking, you can think of as mathematicians or scientists who are much more interested in, in, in what you can think of as, as games of chance or other kinds of games that are numerically based. So, you know, playing dice, even chess, cards, all of these things that involve certain kinds of randomness and chance. So as the idea of, of the uncertainty being a feature of the regular world becomes more you know, becomes accepted, you sort of see uh, these two sort of parallel tracks also intersect. And they really intersect in the late 19th century. And you see the, the, the creation of a whole new range of tools that emerge that rely upon essentially mathematical probability, mathematical statistics, which relies upon probability theory to come up with new tools to understand uh, various aspects, not only about society, <clears throat> uh, you know, pretty much across the board. But one of the early innovations, I think this was uh, uh, Ted Porter, who's one of the, the most important uh, people to have worked on these questions. One of the things that he pointed out um, a few decades ago now is that how important, it wasn't just people in the sciences doing this kind of work and this kind of thinking, but how important people who are working with social phenomena, the kinds of advances they made were to this shift to this sort of probabilistic mode of thinking. And so that's sort of the dominant uh, story that emerges and these, the, we become comfortable, certain tools begin to emerge in the late 19th century. They really begin to be developed and applied in the early 20th century. And in some ways, the apogee of that is <clears throat> large scale random sampling. Second World War as this moment of tremendous innovation. And then, uh, and then the post World War II moment as, as, as again, a new, a new attempt at, at, um, at application. So, so that's sort of the, the, in some ways, the potted history that we have. What emerges, though, is, um, is, is what I pointed out, that there are, there, is, uh, there are serious disagreements about whether this is the only or the best way to understand, uh, especially social phenomena when we're studying, uh, whether it's, it's society, whether it's aspects of society, whether it's population. And I've focused on the debates in the Soviet Union and in China, uh, but I should, I should mention very briefly that there are similar kinds of debates happening in the US in the 1930s and in Germany also. So part of what is happening is that there, there are different communities of, uh, you can think of experts with different kinds of domain expertise, different kinds of um, uh, sort of research goals who are able to see the strengths and weaknesses of different systems. So even in the US, there are people who are especially doing agricultural survey work who are not convinced that large scale random sampling is gonna get them what they need. Similarly, there's a movement in Germany also, but nowhere is it articulated in the theoretical terms that it takes as you see in the Soviet Union and, in, and, and then in China. The debate in the Soviet Union begins in the 1930s. It's again, partly a debate about you know, things that I've alluded to, which has to do with going, let's go back to Marx and see what Marx has said about, um, you know, is there a universal science or should we think about science as broken up into different categories, the natural world, the social world, you know, do you have the, in some ways, the extraterrestrial world uh, and, and, and should we apply the same sets of laws to them? Uh, th this is where I think the debate is interesting because to what extent is this a group, a community trying to claim a certain kind of autonomy, you know, a community of statisticians? I think that's part of the story of what's going on, carve out a space for themselves. Um, but, but the other thing also has to do with, with really, as I suggested, a particular reading of Marx where you can find Marx categorically say that you cannot think of the natural world and the social world as the same thing. They have different laws that apply, you know, the laws that apply to animals are not the same as the laws that apply to human beings. A lot of this boils down in their analysis, their reading to the importance of class. And, and, and in the book, I, I, just give, I offer a few different examples, right, of how you can do certain kinds of statistical analysis that completely face class distinctions within society. And a, a statistician in China or in the Soviet Union would say that this is nonsensical data as a result, because it's not allowing you to understand uh, social reality. It's not allowing you to understand, the, say, the variation in actual income scales, because an average just completely collapses all of these distinctions. Uh, so, so it's coming from a real desire, I think, to capture social reality, uh, but, and it uses that, that distinction between the natural and the social world. Of course, you know, there are people who are much better versed than I am on, on Marx, who have read Marx closely, and you will find other instances where Marx says the exact opposite, where he says, actually, eventually, the natural and the social will combine together and there'll be, you know, all science will be one. So there is, there is a selective kind of reading going on here. I don't want to, so one of the things I want to emphasize is that this is, this is not, Marxist statistics, this is not 
socialist statistics writ large. This is socialist statistics as understood by certain people who self-identified as Marxists and as socialists, right? So I think this again speaks to the different manifestations within larger systems of thought that emerge because Eastern European uh, polities, statisticians there did not buy in to this distinction, the way in which the Soviets and the Chinese did, right? The Indian statisticians that I mentioned briefly, heavily influenced by, <clears throat> by planning and by, by sort of socialist principles, did not accept this. So you see internal variation also, um, but the, the, the broader distinction and, and, and the debates I talk about in the book, they really, they go into sort of, you know, so they go into, I think they talk about is statistics a universal science? Is it a natural science? Is it a social science? So they're, they're, you know, they're trying to make these very sort of fine distinctions and the way in which they, they eventually they end up by saying that no, it's only a social science. And one of the key things there beyond what I've described is the fact that what is the object of research? And by making it a social science, they make the object of statistics society itself and nothing else. And then this has implications on how, uh, how the discipline is organized and how universities are organized and the ways in which people who do mathematics don't do statistics in some ways and the people who do statistics don't engage with the mathematicians. So I don't know if you want me to go into further detail, but, uh, but that's sort of um, a little bit of a sense. No, that was perfect, perfect. We have a question from uh, Asif Shaja, who's also a colleague here at MEI. Um, Asif works on Iran and Indian relationships. Um, Asif, I can, if you can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Just a second. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to <laughs> switch on my camera as well. Uh, thank you so much, I mean, for this opportunity, and uh, thank you so much, Arunab, for enlightening us. Uh, uh, we were under the assumption that uh, Chinese had uh, the collaboration with ISI of Pakistan, you know, but uh, <laughs> you have really told us that the they were ISI. Quite, <laughs> yeah, they were quite, you know, uh, balanced in that particular sense. So very delighted to hear that, and uh, when I look into uh, look into uh, Chinese, uh, you know, experimentation or learning uh, in the statistics. Uh, uh, there is one date uh, because we were also talking about uh, the relevance of your study in contemporary age. You know, we, uh, because we need to uh, have this tendency uh, to apply, you know, in, in the activities that we are involved in. So uh, uh, when I look at uh, December two thousand one. Uh, 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 before that, uh, China was not a member of WTO, so there was not much need for China to share its data, and the others outside would also not be able to so much be the claimants of, of that particular data. But after 2001, after its accession with, to WTO, it had this you know, uh, responsibility, uh, uh, at least on the principle of need to know basis, you know, share mm -hmm. data with the outside world. So what exactly in, in that particular domain of your research statistics uh, the, the methodology that, uh, you know, changed in particular in Chinese, you know, Chinese uh, uh, approach in that particular uh, field. Uh, just one, uh, one, uh, one snippet I wanted to share with you because uh, when you were trying to categorize statistics, because I, I have done mathematics graduation from Delhi University. There are not just mathematics, but also statistics. They were all both in science stream as well as in our system, in the same college, you know? So only, uh, I, I used to think about this epistemology, you know, the purpose of uh, learning a particular thing. I think my, my opinion is that uh, it's, it should be decided by the, the application of it, you know, in which field you apply. Uh, during my graduation, I used to have this thinking that what, why exactly are they, you know, treated differently in two different settings? So I think it should be based on application. So my question to you uh, about that particular, you know, WTO accession after that, what actually uh, changed? Thank you so much. It was a very good experience listening to you. Oh, th thank you so much for <clears throat> your question and your comment at the end. I um, Unfortunately, I have to admit that I am not, uh, you know, I have not looked at the WTO. I mean, in the end, I'm a historian who, who is stuck in, in earlier decades. So I don't know of that particular transition in particular in terms of how it applied to data. It's something that if I have time, I would, I would, I would, I would love to look at. I, my sense though, is that one of the major shifts that would have been instrumental is uh, what I alluded to briefly, um, is um, um, the, the switch that actually happens over the course of the 90s from a material product system 
uh, to the UN system of national accounting. So I think this is uh, both, I think, an attempt to uh, make Chinese data more easily commensurable with global data, but some of it probably is, is very much tied to the negotiations that have been going on about entry into the WTO so that the data that is being shared can then have at least some degree of, of commensurability. So I think that would be one place uh, to, to look. But beyond that, I don't have, I, I haven't really, I have to, I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you so much, but I, I really don't, I don't have a sense of the, the specific debates that went on, uh, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s as, as China entered the WTO uh, and, then, and then the ways in which uh, uh, the, the the supply of data uh, was was affected. One, one one thing I will I will add though is that I think the the, the thing that might be interesting to look at is uh, you know the the National Bureau of Statistics is still the main agency that is supposed to uh, produce the data. It's supposed to make the data available. But whether it leads to uh, a, a, an expansion of the institutions around it that are also collecting and disseminating data, because you know as China becomes a major player and, and this is sort of that moment excuse me, when it does transition to, into becoming a major player in global trade, uh, to what extent are there other agencies that become involved, that are focused on trade, that become sources of, of trade data? Uh, so this is something that I, again, don't know, but I would, this is one of the questions that comes to mind immediately uh, to, to, to look for. Uh, but yeah, but this is, this is uh, I think it's a, it's a very important question as we, as we try and sort of think about uh, uh, sort of the nature of statistical activity in, in, in China uh, today. On, on your uh, second point, very briefly, uh, the uh, your own experience with you know the distinction. I think uh, you're totally right. I think there's a disciplinary distinction. But what's what within the disciplines also? I would suspect though that the principles that were uh, sort of um, um, relayed were probably not different, right? So you you would have had whether you were within the social sciences or within in a math department. Uh, if you take introductory statistics, maybe the the, the expectations in terms of um, uh, what you can do are different. But the underlying principles of what is statistics—that uh, it's a tool uh, that it, it, you know, that it engages with certain sets of, of, of um, sort of um, um, methods and certain sets of assumptions—that would probably be consistent, I would guess, um, as opposed to what we see, I think, in the 50s in China, uh, where you see actually a very sharp divide. So, to put it concretely, in an intro stats class, if you're in a math department in the 1950s in China. Uh, in a, a mathematical statistics department, you are not dealing with socioeconomic data at all. Uh, and if you're in a stats department at, uh, at say, People's University in Beijing, which is the main cadre training university, uh, and you're taking a class, you will not touch anything that has to do with, uh, with uh, probability theory. So you would not even be exposed to a normal curve, for instance, right? So something like that. Uh, so that, that divide, I think, wouldn't exist. But to your larger point about, I think it should be problem-based, is I think absolutely correct. I think once you have a set of tools, then you really need to approach this as, well, what do I need to answer and what is the best tool uh, to, to answer it with? So, so thank you. It, it kind of, I mean, reminds me of a question that I, about, you know, this uh, long lasting uh, problem that they had of, of what the Chinese statisticians had with probability theory and identifying it as the source of, you know, like a capitalist science um, I was just thinking that in a way, it's not too wrong uh, of, of if we think about how, uh, you know, chance and, and sort of monetizing chance becomes central to capitalist growth with insurance companies and so mm -hmm. on, where risk really becomes, you know, somebody who can know the risk better, know the risk more accurately can end up, you know, uh, profiting from it indefinitely. So, I mean, in a way, it's, 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 it's sort of correctly like identifying the symptom maybe I, I, you know you you have hit you've hit the you've hit the nail on the head absolutely and and i think in there's a chapter where i look at sort of how a lot of these debates uh, affect the the community of statisticians the you know sort of what are they doing how are they trying to recalibrate especially those that were prominent pre 1949 how do they try and recalibrate to this sort of new understanding uh, and and you know I make the, the exact arg argument that you just made or, or the observation you just made, that the criticism is actually absolutely on point, you know, that so much of um, the, these methods allow for so much manipulation of a certain kind, whether it's access to data, privilege, access to privileged information that allows you to sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, influence uh, the market, influence the uh, consumer behavior and so on. Um, so, so in some ways, the, the problem was not so much in identifying or making the critique, it was in then how do you 
do you have a, uh, something that you can offer that is more powerful? And that's where in the 50s, the debates, they couldn't, they couldn't sort of make that next step in some ways. Uh, and uh, you know, one way to understand the, 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 your observation also is, is this distinction that some people have written about. Uh, it, mostly people who do political economy, I haven't seen this being written about by, by economists as much, is this distinction between risk and uncertainty as uh, sort of a conceptual difference that is most clearly understood. It, it sort of emerges in the 1920s um, I, I'm trying to remember now, I think uh, um, Keynes writes about it, but also another, another major economist writes about it in the 1920s, uh, where um, uncertainty seemed to be a much more sort of um, um, uh, uh, kind of diffuse and difficult to pin down more abstract concept, whereas risk is something that they can operationalize and quantify. So once you make that distinction, uh, oh, you know, the future is uncertain, but my investment in X business is risky, because of you know is risky up to this point that kind of distinction uh, allows for all kinds of decisions to follow including you know what you what you just alluded to right all kinds of essentially uh, the worst excesses within a bourgeois uh, system bourgeois capitalist system uh, where where you're cheating other people because of privileged information so this 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 is one way in which we can think about the taken to the extreme both systems lead to kind of perverse outcomes it's not that you know it's very difficult to make a normative kind of like oh this is better and that's worse there are these both systems come with again these embedded biases these embedded sort of things that lead to potential problems it's just a question of how do you sort of identify them and how do you sort of control for them in some ways so uh, so yeah this whole distinction between uncertainty risk and the abuse of 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 um, uh, techniques for ascertaining or calculating risk is so much of the history of 20th century finance in some ways actually or 21st century finance also Uh, thank you. I, I, I mean, the conversation, I mean, you you talked about sort of, you know, the early shift um, from, you know, 48 or you know, maybe even a very sudden break from this 40, the 48 moment, um, where not only is there a philosophical shift where people from diverse sort of, you know, methodological perspectives kind of streamline into one, but there's also the construction, as you, as you point out in your book, of this massive bureaucratic department. Mm -hmm that hired about, you know, like 200,000 people, right? Um, it, from going from like, you know, like, uh, like there being like very few state statistics to 200, like, like what motivates this? And also like, what does this like, you know, like the success in some ways that the Chinese government also had in constructing those, how does this shape their imaginations of like the possibilities of what can the state do? Um, yeah, this is, this is a great, this is a great point because I think, uh, there are the story is both of tremendous success and of tremendous incapacity because at one on the one hand by 56 you have this system that has been built that has 200,000 uh, claimed full-time employees and many more who are working part-time especially in the countryside in the villages and so on uh, and and when uh, to go back to the the Indian statistician that I talked about PC Malinovitz when he visits he's blown away by this he's he's sort of he's like and we can we can't even dream of achieving something like this in india you know and partly he says he explains the reason why we are devoting so many resources to large scale random sampling is precisely because we can't build a system like this so there is i think uh, we we shouldn't uh, because it generates tremendous other kinds of incapacities we shouldn't sort of your your point is i think really well taken that we shouldn't fail to notice the kind of bureaucratic power of this early chinese state uh, and you see this in, in, in a whole range of, uh, of areas. So statistics, is, I think, is a good example because it in some ways undergirds so much other, other activity. And a lot of this, I think, uh, speaks to uh, the kind of mobilization that was possible because of um, uh, sort of the, the very nature of the Communist Party itself, I think. If you go back to, uh, you know, if, if you look at the history of the Communist Party, it's interesting in that it starts out very much in a, in a very uh, sort of traditional way an urban party led by intellectuals thinking about uh, you know industrial labor as the as the site of the revolution and so on and that fundamentally shifts by the late 20s and it becomes this fundamentally agrarian peasant based uh, movement but i think it's that peasant based movement and sort of the, the the way in which they're able to organize the experience gained of organizing such large numbers of people and this sort of what has been written about a lot in both in, in political science in particular but also in in, in history um, uh, is sort of the sort of campaign mode of governance that is a real feature of the PRC, as I think has a lot to do with this, right? The the way in which you announce campaigns and sort of it's a it's a mass mobilization that then uh, engages with uh, with whatever that needs to be achieved, both sometimes for um, amazing achievements, sometimes that you know completely 
sort of nonsensical kinds of goals are also, I mean, there's, just to give you one random example, there is a campaign to kill all sparrows in the late 1950s, right? Uh, which then leads to all kinds of other problems because the sparrows are part of a complex ecological sort of uh, cycle. And if you take them out, then it leads to environmental consequences. Uh, but they, they're able to achieve these kinds of things. And so that kind of campaign mode mobilization, a certain kind of militarization of society that goes with it uh, is I think a, a part of this. But what I've tried to suggest in the book in some ways is that even though that is hugely important, the PRC state also had tremendous institutional ambitions. And the campaigns are one way in which you achieve certain kinds of policies, certain kinds of uh, sort of social and economic change. But you also saw a tremendous amount of this made a more formal structures of government that are being set up. And the Stats, uh, Stats Bureau is, I think, a good example of this in terms of how they seriously they took um, the establishment of institutions, the training of personnel, uh, the, uh, the deployment of personnel, uh, and, and, and things like that. So, so part of my hope is that within PRC history, it leads to this kind of rebalancing where we take, we pay as much attention, not, we pay attention not just to the campaign mode of governance, but also this kind of more institutional sort of by the bootstraps, building up something uh, that, that, that has this tremendous, uh, 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 again, this, it, it's two sides of the same coin, tremendous capacity, but as I argue in the book, it also generates tremendous incapacities also, because in the end, the ambitions are so much larger in some ways. Uh, that that it just becomes an impossible sort of it's an it's a it's an ever receding kind of horizon in some ways. Thank you. If I could take you to you know uh, something that that you started your talk with about um, China to turning towards India at a point where you know it was dealing with this problem of or limitations of immunization as a technique or as mm -hmm. a methodology. Uh, I'm wondering what, what made India this kind of paradigmatic or sort of exemplary case for China to turn to? Um, was it simply sort of this third world nationalism, you know, politics that led to it? Or was it more about the science itself or where the, the scientific method, the, the nature of debates in India as well? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, this is partly what I'm, I'm trying to understand in my ongoing work also. I mean, the short answer to your question is that it's a bit of both. I think there are geopolitical shifts that happen starting in 1955 at Bandung, uh, where uh, Chinese foreign policy takes a particular turn towards the global south, becoming more open and presents a less threatening image of itself to the global south. Uh, and that includes then I think greater engagement with, uh, with India as well. Of course, what I, there's also, but there are exchanges with India that predate that moment that are going on. Uh, but I think that the, the, the political currents changing is, is certainly a part of it. There's also, I think, something to do with internal political sort of shifts. There is a moment in 1956 of relative uh, intellectual freedom, uh, you know, which uh, for those familiar with, with PRC history will know, which is known as the 100 Flowers Movement, where the party essentially says, uh, you know, invites all kinds of feedback and criticism about what has been achieved up to that point. Uh, but it suggests a certain degree of, I think, intellectual openness. Then that is precisely when these exchanges with, with India really take off. So I think that is part of it also that a lot of these senior statisticians see this as a moment of opportunity, perhaps, uh, to, to push, push this through. Um, but there is also, I think, a recognition uh, that, uh, that what is happening here, and I think this is where I think, you know, I, I'm often glib in saying this is Sino-Indian, but it's really an, a particular institute in India that's doing this. It's not, you know, we, we often fall into these national categories and we should be, and I've done this myself right now, but we should be really wary of this because, you know, if you look at the history of the Indian Statistical Institute and Malanobis within 1950s Indian history, he's an extremely divisive figure. Uh, there are people who really buy into what he's doing, but there are other people, there are people at the, I think it's the Gokhale Institute in Pune, for instance, who are strong critics of what he's trying to do with regard to planning. Uh, so there are internal debates that are going on that I'm obviously flattening when I talk about Sino-Indian scientific exchange, but the role that the ISI had come to play in so the Indian ISI, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Asif, uh, had come to play in, uh, in uh, the world of statistics, in particular, the world of uh, what you can think of as applied statistics, which is what ran large scale random sampling uh, really is, uh, I think was a, an important sort of, uh, it is also a very important variable that explains why with India, why at this particular point in time. Um, and, and so once so far and that, that the three other members of the delegation who visited right after Joan Lai's visit in 1956, what they see is pretty much experts from all over the world are attending that 25th 
anniversary celebration. So there is an, an, an them, them, that must have had an impact too. You're seeing some of the top mathematicians from the Soviet Union. You're seeing some of the top mathematicians from the UK and from the US. So to recognize that what is happening here is, you know, distinctive. It's not something um, that you can get anywhere else. Is also, I think, I think a feature of this. And this is partly what in my my one of the projects I'm 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 working on now is an is what I'm attempting to do is to sort of see are there other instances that we have you know, over time for whatever reason, sort of ignored or not recognized as being actually important moments in the history of science or the history of uh, economics, uh, economic exchange in the 20th century uh, that have taken place. Uh, I, I do it because of my own training anchored in China and then some degree of familiarity with Indian history and some training in Indian history as across China and India. But I would wager we can do this across all sorts of other parts of the global South and I think what will emerge is, is other, I think other, other kinds of exchanges that are happening at the frontiers of whatever that knowledge might be. Uh, so, so I think uh, it's, it's to recognize both the, 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 the larger political, the global geopolitics that maybe is creating openings, but then also the, the sort of internal kinds of uh, uh, motivations that are really, so this in the end, the reason why this is so compelling is because for the statisticians uh, in China is because what they have is not working. It is a, it is a, it's a very clear recognition that this in the agricultural sector in particular, these methods are not working. And if we persist with them, we are going to end up in, in a bad place, right? So I think there is, and, and that kind of, so that's an expert kind of assessment. That is, that is you're, you're, you're drawing upon your expertise to recognize uh, both, both the nature of a problem and where a solution might be, might be found. Um, so, so to that extent, I think it's, we need to constantly balance both of these, uh, both of these registers because they're, you know, it's never one or the other, I guess. Um, but uh, again, one, sorry, one final point I mentioned. So one of the things that I've been trying to do is therefore, and, and Michael Gordon, who's the uh, historian of science at Princeton has been making this point in some of his, his recent writings also is when we look to do these kinds of histories, global south, south, south solidarity, networks of science or net, other kinds of networks. I think we need to, there has been a lot of attention paid to uh, sort of the discursive level, you know, so intellectuals, cultural elites, the ways in which they're talking about building this kind of solidarity, the ways in which they travel, all of which is hugely important in, you know, in imagining these alternative possibilities. But what he has been pointing out, he, he doesn't do it for the global south, but he's doing it more in terms of the history of science itself, is that we need to look at the practitioners themselves. And what are they saying? What are the motivations that are driving them? And I think that adds a very important element to this larger story then. And so that is partly what I've been trying to do. The, the case of the statisticians is one example. And as I said, in my current work, I've been looking at other sort of sets of scientists that are actually in dialogue with each other. You know, of course, they're influenced by, by larger global politics, but in the end, they're also motivated by the ambitions of their, their specific fields or the problems of their specific fields to, to unite. And, and, and try and sort of collaborate and exchange, uh, you know, exchange expertise and so on. If I could, I mean, as a follow-up question, ask you, you know, as a, as a, you know, put on your, the more like the, the historian and to kind of take us back to the workshop where you had, how you decided on, you know, some of these questions yourselves about how much weightage should you put on the political, you know, like explaining any historical phenomenon and, you know, like everyone runs into it, but particularly people who work on knowledge societies, how much weightage do you put on to internal intellectual debate versus, you know, outside political currents versus personal, um, you know, uh, uh, personal circumstances and so on, or sort of more subjective conditions. Um, you know, it, it, everyone, you know, everyone who work, all most historians deal with it, you know, people with religion, deal with it too, you know, like is, is a religion, it is, you know, is it, is it only because of, you know, the politics of a time or is, is there, a, is there an agency to the intellectual debate itself that leads to that? Um, how did you make that decision? How did you make some of the, some of the more complicated decisions yourself? Yeah, so this is, this is a great, it's a great question. It's a question about both methodology. It's also unfortunately a question about sources. You know, in the end, I think as historians, we often get, we are, we are tied down by the nature of sources we're able to find. Um, I was lucky because I found uh, not just published, you know, sort of me, you know, any published material that emerges from that moment, any moment that you're studying, you know, has gone through at least one round of mediation where the author themselves have decided, this is what I want to put out for wider readership. Uh, so that comes with limitations because we precisely are not, we're not getting that level, we're not entering that layer where these other considerations 
might have influenced the, 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 the format of what has been published, the content, the specific nature of the argument and so on. So one way in which that I was, I think I've become more sensitive to these questions is by virtue of finding other kinds of sources and in particular correspondence between scientists. So that gives you a slightly unmediated, it's not, it's never completely, you know, unmediated, but it gets a slightly less mediated level of, level of exchange than a published essay, even if it's, um, even if it's not an academic essay, but if, even if it's, let's say, a speech delivered at some gathering, you know, something like that, which is meant by the author for public consumption versus a letter that they wrote to a colleague, say, a Chinese scientist wrote to a colleague in India, for instance. So that allows me to begin to get at the layers of motivation that are going on. So the frustrations with politics, the frustrations with China being invaded by, by Japan, for instance, uh, along with then something that's much more dri driven by an immediate sort of, this is the question I'm working on, which has no connection to, uh, to, to the larger politics. So that's one way in which I try and, uh, I try and sort of uh, get at these, to the, whenever possible. So to, to look at as broad a set of sources as I can find. Uh, the other thing that becomes hugely important is when, when it's possible is to do, to, to, to do oral history interviews or, or to, you know, this is sort of go back to the ethnographic mode in some ways, because you get, you get, and of course it's filtered through memory, it's filtered through all sorts of other, other problems that we are aware of, but that provides another layer to how people remember, uh, you know, how they, how they process things. And sometimes this can be actually very unhelpful. I've had, I've, I've conducted interviews where I've been basically told, uh, oh, that I was actually categorically told this by, by a very senior uh, statistician uh, who was active in the 1950s? Oh, that there was no difference between socialist statistics and and you know what what was what was happening in the West. And I was like, no, I mean, I'm looking at all this material. You guys are obsessing about this. But in his memory, he didn't want to acknowledge um, you know that. So, uh, but 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 this question of intentionality of agency is I don't I mean there's there's it, you you are in the end you you at the first stage you're you're a slave to to the sources that you find. If you're able to get these sources at a more granular level, at a less mediated level, I think you can begin to parse some of this. The other way in which I think you can parse this is if you can do triangulation, if you can sort of find multiple sources that speak about the same thing, multiple actors who are speaking about the same thing. There often you can notice slippages that I, I found at least to be productive because they're talking about the same thing uh, and you notice minor differences in perspective, minor differences in language that can then provide a small opening to well, maybe there is something going on here. Maybe there's a debate. Debate with with with. Uh, uh, I don't know how relevant this would be to say people are studying religion, uh, but I certainly found another very useful thing is different editions of things that were written or published often have differences, and that also at times alludes to uh, sort of how the politics is interfering. So the same speech, I found the original version from 1952 uh, because it was published in 1952 in a journal, and then. In the, the early 80s, that speech was part of the collected works of that person. But that speech then has been edited in certain ways. So that at times can give you a sense also of what has, how, how the politics has changed and what the emphasis, you know, like what was emphasized, what was not seen to be sensitive then now has become sensitive in the 80s and so on. So that's just a, a sort of an abstract example. But so things like that, that, that allow us to begin to begin to get at this question. Uh, but, but I think that the starting point, and this goes back perhaps to to Alex's question also is to is to really go is to completely dispense with the idea that any any side or any knowledge is going to be objective, uh, which I think we often is the easiest thing we do, and it's often the thing that we all do subconsciously. You know, we privilege one side of the comparison, one side of the 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 set of actors we're looking at as being more advanced, more objective. Uh, you know, whatever sort of uh, sort of quality you want to ascribe to them. So to, to avoid doing that, and this, in this, what has been hugely influential for me from my grad school days is, is the work of, I guess, what you can call the California School of Economic History. So people like Ken Pomeranz and Roy Bin Wong and others, and their sort of methodological approach to uh, what, what, what they called a reciprocal comparison, right? When you, when you proceed with a comparison, you don't, the, the classic problem always becomes that you implicitly assume one side is the ideal that you measure against. You know, so if I'm comparing A with B, I'm, I'm going to be like B is taller than A or shorter than A and so on. So that immediately assumes that A is some kind of norm. And what they suggest, the harder thing to do is to assume that the norm exists outside of A and B. And then you see A and B as just being two, two sort of uh, trajectories out of many possible trajectories. Uh, it sounds fairly simple, but I think if you approach sort of research questions with that in mind, it can be quite liberating uh, from some of the assumptions that we often make. 
Uh, so at least I found it to be to be quite liberating at times. So um, so anyway, I, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, guess I, it's it's something that I grapple with all the time. But I, you know, it's it's not it's not something that I have always a clear cut answer to. No, that's I mean, you know, very helpful. Of course, this, these are questions that, you know, big questions we that all struggle almost with. everyone everyone kind yeah. of you know struggles yeah. with. Yeah. Um, I, I want I mean, if anybody if nobody else has any question, I want to like throw another question more to do with. With the with 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 the provocative you know like um, statement that you had in your introduction, um, but couldn't get to uh, you know fully elaborate, was that you saw that you 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 suggested that this current moment, in which we also have this you know uh, excess of data, where now date like the idea of the you know this exhaustive method now no longer seems that kind of impossibility. Or that kind of like big challenge with with you know on with the online media and sort of you know I Chinese government in some ways is leading um, this kind of totalitarian complete data so, uh, you suggest that 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 you know that that we need to perhaps place this current moment within a longer genealogy of you said you know, the, the third wave um, what is what is like placing it this moment within this broad within this you know longer genealogy how does this let us see this this moment the, the contemporary debate at least differently in some ways. Right, yeah, no, thank, thanks for this question. So this is something that I keep, I do keep thinking about. And uh, so so what I try, what I try and sort of point out there is that I think it's partly a question about the, the, the human imagination about what one wants to achieve, you know, the kinds of transformative changes that we want to see uh, and the ways in which technical capacity or technological capacity fundamentally shapes that. So the reason I, I sort of want to place it in a longer genealogy is is because I see the, the ways in which we talk about big data today, you know, the ways in which we are so, there's almost a sort of proselytizing kind of uh, uh, fervor to it, right? That it's going to solve all these problems. Uh, you know, whether you look at it in terms of the social credit system in, 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 in China, whether you look at it in terms of um, the, um, in an Indian context with, uh, with the, the national ID system, Aadhaar, which is again supposed to be like, oh, we're gonna be able to provide public goods to everyone, you know, uh, and so on. Um, I think this kind of essentially utopian thinking you find in earlier moments also where you see a similar kind of leap in, in technological capabilities. So the, what I point out with the current uh, moment being sort of the third phase in this genealogy, it's the third because for me, at least in the modern era, you see a similar kind of moment in the late 19th century where you see the creation of these, you know, sort of radically new statistical tools. So things that are so commonplace today that we don't really think about them much anymore, but things like correlation, things like regression that fundamentally give shape to these emerging disciplines like sociology. Suddenly, you know, you can study a social phenomena like suicide in a very sort of concrete way, and you can start making hypo hypotheses and testing hypotheses. So, you know, so, and then suddenly that leads to this kind of tremendous possibilities. And the, the big warning there is that, you know, you, you start with these utopian visions or, or at least these visions about fundamental transformations, or now we have these powerful tools and we can change society. And the danger is that we don't know what the upper bound of some of these can be. You know, if you think about it, to go back, go back to, to, to math mathematics, if you have a, a quadratic or a, or a multivariable function, you know that it has a maximum and a minimum in some ways, if you plot it in, in two-dimensional or multi-dimensional space. Uh, and often I think a lot of this the, the enthusiasm is driven by the, the, the minima, right? We can achieve these things and we can transform them. What we don't have, and I think this is structural, we just have no way in our moment to understand what are the other ways in which a technology might be used. Uh, and the, the late 19th century moment, a good example of this is, eugen is eugenics. A lot of this leads into a lot of people becoming convinced that, oh, eugenics is an important way to organize society. Of course, there are other intellectual trends that feed into it also, but I think the, it's it's not it's not pure coincidence that many of the early drivers of eugenics, many of the early promoters of eugenics, are the seminal figures in the world of statistics. People like Francis Galton, people like Carl Pearson, you know, including people like like Fisher, who becomes a major mentor and colleague to Malinovis, right? And Malinovis' early work uh, in the 1920s is actually on phrenology, right, measuring skulls and somehow using that to, to figure out, you know, all sorts of things that we would now deem, deem extremely problematic. So that's one instance where I think you see this kind of pattern. The 50s to me is, is a similar moment where you suddenly, partly because of World War II and the kinds of technologies that emerged, you see this tremendous sort of, a whole new set of tools that are available. And there's a tremendous amount of optimism. 
I would contend that it's part of this optimism that that gives birth to development economics as a discipline, to a range of other disciplines that emerge, or, or you know, other sets of goals that emerge, right? Which now, when we look back and say, well, these are deeply problematic ways of intervening in society and economics, but at that point, were seen to be transformative. So I see this. So the current moment of big data, I see as part of this kind of genealogy where we have suddenly our capacity has suddenly expanded, you know, and now what was absolutely impossible to imagine in terms of collecting data, storing data, or processing data is no longer a constraint. So now we're thinking up, or now we can predict all kinds of things. If we just collect enough consumer behavior, we can predict what the next, uh, what kind of product will next be uh, desirable, right? You can do this with elections. You can do this in so many ways. And again, I think my fear is we are operating at the, at the, at the, at the minimum level of expectations and we have no idea <laughs> what you know what the abuse of this uh, to put it in in one way might be uh, so so in that sense i think we 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 have we have that's one of the lessons to remind ourselves that it's not going to be transformative in the ways in which we think it's going to lead to significant missteps and these missteps are not aberrations they are structural they they are internal to the ways in which these things evolve so that would be one sort of broader broader kind of message um, the other one, very briefly, uh, I should mention also is that it's a reminder, I think, uh, that that at no point did these methods completely supersede pre-existing methods. So, you know, uh, in, and, and with the big data, it's a reminder to say, well, the stochastic methods, the ethnographic methods are going to be hugely important. You should not forget them. Because right now there's this impetus, right, that everything can be solved by big data. Everyone should study big data. Again, that's the other broader lesson. No, 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 slow down. These other modes of knowing are just as significant, if not, you know, more significant, depending on on what you need to study. Uh, no, thank you so much. I mean, it was an absolute pleasure both discussing this with you and reading the book itself. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We've, you know, unfortunately run out of time. Um, I had I had some other questions and maybe I'll ask you later on too. Uh, but uh, you know, thank you everyone also for joining into our inaugural session. Please stay tuned to us. Then you know, we'll update you about upcoming speakers as soon as we get confirmation. Um, so thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you guys soon in our upcoming events as well. Um,